everybody to this uh, session. So we are waiting for the panelists to uh, join us. Uh, so we'll start as soon as uh, all the panelists are here. If you just connected, we are uh, just waiting for all the uh, speakers to uh, and, uh, and the panelists to join. And as soon as they are all in the uh, meeting room, we'll be able to start with uh, uh, this uh, second round table. Contacted by Simon is having uh, some technical problem, but he's going to join us uh, uh, as soon as possible. In the meantime, uh, uh, he asked me to introduce, uh, to welcome everybody and to start uh, and to start uh, the session. So I would like very much to, to thank uh, all the um, participants of the round table, particular uh, 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 Parta Dasgupta, whom I don't see since a long time, he had a lo is a long time friend of ICTP. Uh, we had a very uh, uh, fruitful program on uh, ecological economics. And then, uh, well, Andrea Rinaldo, uh, Alessandro Tavoni um, is. Uh, Okay, okay, that's fine. Well, Kanchan also well, joining yes, for this. Uh, okay, thanks, thanks everybody for. Um, yes. So, we've, and, um, scheduled so uh, Jacobo, you want to uh, say on, something on for uh, like a good the start? Yeah, I think we can proceed with the panel and say some general announcement about the uh, school uh, later. Your yes. Are, so the so the 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 idea is to first uh, introduce the the panelists. Uh, so so maybe we can have a round of uh, introduction by by each of you. Maybe we can start with uh, uh, Parta. You want to start? Well, oh, thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Look, there is a background noise coming. Somebody speaking. Uh, now oh, is there a translator at work or what? Yes, maybe it's better. Maybe it was me. Ah, yes. Sorry. Is it better? Yes. Well, this, yeah, that's fine. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm part of the Skupta. I'm uh, speaking from Cambridge. And as uh, Matteo said, we've, we're, we worked together many years ago, two decades ago at ICTP. He was hosting a program that Simon and I and uh, Carl Juran Mailer ran uh, for four or five years, I think, at the time of uh, early 2000s on ecological economics. And I, I'm delighted to be here. Where is, uh, where is Simon? Uh, Simon uh, had some uh, technical problems, but I think he's going to join us uh, very soon. Okay. Anyway, thank you. Alessandro, you want to go ahead? Sure. Thank you, Matteo. <clears throat> My name is Alessandro Tavoni. I'm uh, connecting from Bologna, where I'm based in Italy. 
the University of Bologna. I'm an, uh, an economist as well, an environmental economist. Uh, I've worked uh, with uh, with Simon and, uh, and colleagues, so I have a bit of understanding of uh, uh, complex adaptive systems and ecology as well, but my main uh, area would be environmental economics and behavior economics. So I try to address environmental dilemmas using these tools, and we can talk a bit more about it as we go. Okay, in the meantime, Simon joined us. So Simon, we started introducing uh, the panelists uh, with uh, Parta and uh, Alessandro. Then I'll leave you uh, to, to go ahead. Good, good. Now maybe we can turn to Karina and Kanchan. Karina, you're 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 muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Uh, I'm Karina Nyborg. I'm uh, speaking from Oslo, Norway. Uh, I'm like Alessandro. I'm an environmental economist uh, who also does a lot of behavioral economics. Uh, I've been uh, working a bit with uh, Simon and other ecologists in uh, connection with the Bayer Institute in Sweden. Uh, and I'm looking forward to this. Very good. Kanchan, I assume you're on somewhere. I uh, don't hear her. Is, is Kanchan Chopra on? Let's come back to her and, and go to Andrea Rinaldo. Yes, and thank you, Simon. Good to see you. Uh, Andrea Rinaldo, I'm a professor at the Ecole Polytechnique Federale in Lausanne, but right now I'm in Italy, my home place. I'm in Padua now, and you see a piece of my beloved hometown, Venice, in the background during the lockdown. And uh, my work is on water controls on Biota, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. Very good. Mercedes, are you on? I think Mercedes has not joined yet. Okay, Kanchan, I'm glad to see you there. Why don't you, we're just introducing ourselves. Could you? Just say a few words about uh, who you are and what you do. I don't know if Kanchan can hear me yet. Kanchan, are, can you hear me? I'm sure we'll get these problems sorted out. In, Kanchan, can you hear me now? Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello, Simon Kanchan. Yes. Can you hear me? Kanchan, can can you hear yet? Yes, I can hear you. I can we're, hear. You. Good. We're we're all introducing ourselves. Uh, and uh, just could you just say a few words about what you where you are and what you do? Although I think most of us know, but go ahead. Uh, my name is Kanchan Chopra. Uh, I work in Delhi at the Institute of Economic Growth, or I'm associated with that now. Uh, was on the faculty and was director for a long time. My area of work, of course, environment and development. And in the course of my work, I have been uh, privileged to look at different aspects of the relationship between environment and development. I have been at ICTPS for a number of summer schools and winter schools. And I think that's all that I would like to say at the moment. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all for joining us. Matteo, I assume you uh, introduced yourself. Well, no, but uh, unfortunately, as I mentioned to you, I, I have to leave for another meeting. So yes. I, okay. I'm very sorry about this. And I wish you a very interesting uh, panel discussion. Very good. Thank you all very much. 
So as most of you know, um, except for the panelists, in the lecture I gave Monday, I made the argument that uh, building stronger interfaces with economics and the other social sciences was one of the uh, great challenges facing theoretical ecology and any ecology that has to do with the environment in, in the next century. Um, there are a number of cross-cutting issues I'm hoping we will touch on today. Um, how do you value nature? How do we discount the future? How do we deal with equity within um, populations, across populations, across time? How do we get cooperation in dealing with problems of the commons and public goods? What's the role of pro-sociality and social norms? Uh, how do we incorporate the dynamics of human behavior during crises like pandemics, which was the subject really of, of yesterday's uh, roundtable. But I'd like to begin by trying to filter all of this through one of the fundamental issues that faces us, namely the decline of biological diversity. And the most influential th thing that's being done on this topic in, in, in a long time is the so-called Dasgupta report um, that Partha is leading for the British government. So I'd like to begin by asking Partha, uh, my longtime friend and colleague, to tell us what that project is and what the issues are in biological diversity that ought to interest theoretical ecologists, applied ecologists, economists, and all those working at the interface. Partha. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Is it, uh, am I? Yes, very clear. So the, um, the UK Treasury invited me last summer, that is 2019, spring actually, to produce a, it's a independent global review of the economics of biodiversity. So there has been, one of the nice aspects of this has been that there's been no influence from government circles as to how I conduct the review, what is said in it. It's entirely a personal uh, view. Of course, I've been helped by a team at the Treasury, goes without saying, who are an extremely uh, talented group of young people, selected, self-selected because they, I think, applied to be on the on the uh, review um, team. Um, so it's been a great uh, experience. Now the the review is completed now, um, and it's gone to the senior ministers of the Treasury and, and DEFRA, the Environment Ministry, and it will be formally launched in Feb on February the 2nd, I think, 2021, in a month and a half's time, at the Royal Society, which were Venki, Venki Rama, uh, Venki, the, um, the um, president of the Royal Society will be, will be the host, if you like, with members of the cabinet, I guess. So what is it about? Well, first of all, although the, the, the review is on biodiversity, one should remember biodiversity is, an, is a character, a property of ecosystems or, or whatever system, natural system you're studying with biological trappings in it. It's a property, it's not an asset. It's a characteristic of an asset. So the intuition that ecologists such as Simon and others have had all these decades that we ought to be uh, looking at the biosphere at the top to the smallest allowable notion of an ecosystem as a component was exactly right. Um, there are many ways of defining biodiversity, but once you start going in that route, uh, we're in trouble because it will become like sociology, define your term kind of thing. So we're looking at ecosystem services uh, this has been much work done on that, and we take start from there. Now, the position is to, to the idea is to regard nature as an asset. I'm using the word nature really as a as a simple way of conveying the idea that it could be the large macro study, or it could be a small ecosystem, maybe a threshing gown or a ground or a forest plot, uh, depending on the context. So we're looking at assets uh, on a par, more, more fundamental, of course, but in the same vein as produced and human capital, we're looking at natural capital here. And so the, 
we convert the entire problem as an asset management problem, whether you are a first private investor or whether you are a social reformer or whether you are head of some para, para national institution. And so it's built on that. The value itself could not necessarily be user value, use value. It could be intrinsic value of societies, all societies one think, can think of has to regard some assets, some natural capital, as sacred even. So that shouldn't deter us from thinking of it as an asset once you re recognize that the worth has many dimensions to it. Once you recognize that, then you're, you're really talking about the economics of the biosphere. It's as large a subject as that. What we show, the theorem that really drives the whole uh, unifies the treatment of the economics of biosphere is the equivalence between what we call inclusive wealth and intergenerational welfare. These two objects have different sources. Welfare is a normative notion altogether. And I'm talking about intergenerational one, adding up maybe the generational well-being or some nonlinear function doesn't matter. It's, that's not the important thing. The important thing is that you're including future people in it. And whereas wealth is a value of stocks, assets. And that seems more like the means to the ends. The connection between the two, the equivalence, lies in the, lies in the prices, the values that you attribute to the assets. So Simon was exactly right in thinking that valuation becomes an important part of the problem that ties, if you like, the means, which are the assets, and the ends, which are uh, which are which are reflected in well-being, human well-being, or indeed the well-being of nature. That's not ruled out at all. If there is intrinsic value, uh, if it's sacred, they'll have a value independent of what it does for us. So the approach we take is much broader than is given, usually given in environmental and resource economics, but that's not a weakness of environmental and resource economics. It's very useful to have use value uh, human use value as a start. And the reason is that one thing we point out over and over again in the review is that using biased estimates can be very informative. If use value alone tells us that we must conserve nature, then of course, if you add non-use value, intrinsic value, there'll be an additional reason for conserving nature. So biased ones are not to be dispensed with. Okay, when I say the equivalence of these two ideas of inclusive wealth, which goes in the direction of national accounting, if you like, suggesting that national accounts now ought to move away from flows to uh, balance sheets, if you like, or firms. Um, and that the overall thing is an asset management problem tells us that the equivalence result is telling us that the aim of the game is value maximization. That is, whoever it is who is managing a portfolio, uh, whether it's the personal investor or whether it's a social reformer, doesn't matter, the whole uh, range can be accommodated. Uh, they will be using different prices, obviously, market prices for the investor, private investor, social prices or accounting prices or values, social values. If you're, if you're a reformer, a citizen, thinking as a citizen, uh, you're interested in maximizing the value of your portfolio. And that's the same thing as saying maximizing wealth. So wealth maximization turns out to be essentially a portfolio management instruction. So that unifies both macro economics of growth and development to very, very micro management of assets. So that's broadly speaking, what we are concerned with. Now I want to end with the, just as a preliminary remark, the final observation. What makes this area particularly interesting intellectually and deep conceptually is that nature has three properties which are not usually shared by other uh, forms of human capital. First is, of course, the well-known property of mobility. Nature is always on the move. And mobility leads to these externalities which we all understand very well. We economists understand very well and with ecologists have done a lot of work on it. I want to leave that aside for the moment. There are two other features 
which the review uh, emphasizes. One is that nature is often, very often, silent. Natural processes are silent. What's happening under your feet in the soils are not audible. You need extremely precise instruments to go to that. You know, on a daily basis, you can't. And the other is that it's invisible. So invisibility and silence of nature makes monitoring of human activity extremely hard of what we are doing to nature. In fact, it makes it impossible. So the review ends by suggesting we work through, I work through serious issues of institution, what should be, what can be observed, what can't what can be verified, how far the law can handle matters, how far social norms can handle matters. Those are discussed in detail, but invisibility and uh, silence means that there will be a residual aspects of our activities, which will not be monitorable, no matter how good your institutions are. So in some sense, the review points to the limits of institutions as a way of bringing our private in, in incentives al aligned with our citizens' goals, our, our, our goals as citizens, uh, which means that there will be a residual amount that will not be observable. And the only way we can manage to live at peace with nature, which is another way of saying at peace with ourselves, since we are embedded in nature, we're not external to nature, is self-constraint, uh, uh, restraint. In other words, we have to be at the end of the day, both judge and jury of our own actions, never mind other people's actions. Uh, so the review ends with a plea for a reform of education. Uh, it suggests we appeal to the idea that nature studies should begin right at the beginning as, 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 as primary school and not to be dropped as we go through our educational process. In effect, it's appealing to all of us to become in part naturalists. I'll stop here then and the, can, we can take the discussion. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Partha. Before I turn to the other panelists, could you elaborate a little bit on how this uh, framework deals with the problem of discounting the future. This yeah. has been a subject of debate, even if they, even ignoring hyperbolic discounting, how, how do we decide what's the right discount rate to use? Okay, that's, that's very good. The, 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 we are really looking at intertemporal prices, I suppose. That's what we mean by discounting. Um, it's an asset management. We are still at the level of asset management but typical asset management problem portfolio selection is concerned with managing the assets at a moment in time. We've got portfolios to choose between and we look at today's investment, tomorrow's realization, and then we can reorganize uh, re our portfolio. Uh, the, the question that Simon is asking relates to a further problem in uh, portfolio management that is portfolio management over time. Typically, when you think of a portfolio manager, he's got a certain amount of assets, uh, it, it, wealth to invest, and then that's, and he's choosing between alternative portfolios. But the intertemporal problem lies in asking a prior question, how much should he consume and how much should he actually invest? So that too is a portfolio problem. And uh, what we re regard as first order conditions, you know, oiler conditions in both in op optimization exercises, is a portfolio, uh, is an arbitrage condition. Okay, so that's that's the background. I take the position, as we all should, that accounting prices or shadow prices or social values are far more subjective and far more amorphous than market prices, which are much more real for these accounting prices, especially about the future. Uh, so much of it is based on the decision makers understanding of what is feasible and what is desirable. These things cannot be aggregated across all people. People will differ and in a democratic society, we, will, we can argue about them, we can discuss it, but the idea that there's a hard stuff out there which we pluck out of air, that's out, that's not on. So social discount rates, which are intertemporal prices, price of 
future goods compared to today's goods of the same goods, let's say consumption or investment, doesn't matter what your unit of count is, is going to be inherently subjective element. And if I say it's 4% and Simon says it's 2%, there will be a reason for us to have a discussion as to how we have come to our conclusions or not if our, what our conclusions are tentative suggestions. And the discussion may illuminate, we may in fact converge. That's the stuff of, uh, uh, of debate on matters which are not hard. For the private investor, the discount rate may be the market price. Okay, well then, you know, he's, he's small, he can't affect the prices. So he takes the prices as given. But we're not looking at the problem from the point of view of citizen, because Simon is asking about social discount rate, not private discount rate. And there we have a problem in the sense of problem at one level, and another level, it's not a problem. A, a good, diverse, democratic society will have disagreements, maybe. But we resolve, resolve those disagreements through the political process. We don't shoot, at, shoot each other or persuade each other that we are all in agreement when we may not be. So. Uh, what does it really amount to? It amounts to the idea that we want to internalize our, these externalities over time. And the, I'll finish here by just reminding us of the short circuit that economists have so far made, which I think has been extremely dangerous, damaging because it's faulty science in pretending, here's the idea. The idea is, well, look, um, we, we, we all care about our children. And if we are intelligent, we realize our children will care about their children. And therefore by recursion, if we are intelligent, we'll be caring about our own grandchildren, great grandchildren and so forth. Okay, so why not leave it to the market? Why not leave it to our own judgments? And that's been used very decisively in American welfare economics. The idea of a representative household as re reflecting an entire economy. Now, the problem with that argument, and it's really astonishing that it could in fact survive so long, even in the case in a world in which you're look, studying externalities like global climate change, is that I may care about my great grandchildren with great unerring accuracy, and Simon might do the same with his grandchildren. But there is no reason to believe that he will care equally about my grandchildren or me about his grandchildren. That's the whole stuff about externalities. So that's, that route is not on. We really cannot use market rates of return for social discounting, for this externality reason, which brings me back to the point that really at the end of the day as citizens, we then say to ourselves, I say to myself, I must care about, I must take into account Simon's grandchildren. And Simon as a citizen says, yes, Papa also has, will have grandchildren and he should enter my my calculation when I think about social discount rates. But there's no obvious reason how we should necessarily come to the same rate, which is where I began by saying they're going to be ultimately somewhat subjective. They won't be arbitrary. They won't be wild. If somebody says it's 100%, oh boy, we will ask him really, pin him down and say, go and explain why you, how, where you get 100% and uh, you know, all the trade-offs that are involved. Okay? Thank you very much. Um, Karina, I'd like to turn to you next. Right. Sorry, I lost my headphones. Now I can hear you. Yeah, I'd like to turn to you now. Yeah. For, for comments on, on what Partha has been telling us. Right. So so I think the what Partha said uh, earlier on, on, uh, on the importance of on non-observability uh, is is a very very important point and uh, I, he said he said a lot of what I would have said myself and he said it in a much better way uh, than I could have done um, but I think you know um, economists have been working with um, environmental and ecological economics for many many years and for a lot of the problems that we face economists have, good solutions uh, but one of one of the main problems that we don't really know how to solve in 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 a centralized way at least is the problem that often we cannot see what people are doing and 
uh, if we want to limit uh, the depletion of natural resources, then we need, and we want to do it in a centralized way, we need to somehow be able to see what's going on. And if nature doesn't shout out when she's being exploited too much, uh, it's hard to do that. So uh, I think uh, one of the things that economists don't really have very good centralized policies to solve um, is a lot of the problems linked to this un or non-observability. Uh, and I think it's it's um, we we cannot really get around the idea that Parta is advocating that partly we we do I mean even if politicians listen to economists in their suggestions of how to solve pollution problems for example um, we uh, we cannot really solve environmental problems satisfactory if people don't feel uh, a moral obligation, uh, social obligation, but also a sort of internal moral obligation to take good care of nature. And um, I agree with Porta that uh, a very important tool to try to make that happen is actually to start education about nature very early on. Uh, but also it, it is possible that um, policymakers can have uh, can have a role in shaping social and moral norms. Education is one thing, uh, but I have also been concerned about in my own research uh, that a lot of what we do in society is shaped by at least partly by our need to coordinate our actions. So, um, so often it is hard to change your own behavior because you need to coordinate with what other people are doing. Um, and policymakers can often help uh, change the ways we coordinate. Social norms can be one example of such coordination. Uh, we often share, share values, share habits, um, and sometimes you can, uh, sometimes there will be multiple equilibria and we are in a bad equilibria when it comes to uh, uh, protection of nature. Uh, and sometimes it is possible for policymakers to contribute to flip the economy to a better equilibrium. For example, um, think of, um, um, our diets. Uh, if you live in a if you live in a society of meat eaters, then it is um, very inconvenient to be a vegetarian because every time you visit somebody or you're sharing a meal with somebody, you're you feel you're making trouble for the others, and the others feel you're making trouble for them. Uh, but if you live in a society of vegetarians, it is the meat eater who is causing problems and getting problems, uh, and thus may uh, not be invited, for example. So, um, so, and to get from one situation to the other, um, public authorities may have a role in, for example, temporarily uh, subsidize vegetables, tax, meats, um, things like that, and also, uh, also promoting uh, policies that can help change um, habits. Okay, Th thank you very much. By the way, I have put a, a link in the chat to the current um, UK government uh, site for the um, Das Gupta review, which that part of it is public. Uh, Partha, it, 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 it's not yet complete, is that right? Oh yes, it's complete. Uh, it's been sent the, as I was saying, the, uh, okay. our obligation was first to send it to the senior ministers and right. uh, copies have been sent also to the advisory panel that the, the treasury had um, uh, created for us, for, for, for my review. But uh, it, it will not be made public until it's been um, uh, handed over 
officially uh -huh. some protocol uh, with, with, the, with the finance minister. And that'll be on 2nd of February. The moment it's done, it'll be on the website, all three. I should say there'll be three documents. One is the review itself, which is a technical piece of work. It's about 500, uh, 600 pages long now, uh, because as I say, it's the economics of biosphere and a good deal of the economics had actually to be redone to That's make nice. it in line with what I was sketching uh, for you, including the points that uh, Karin made. The points I was making are somewhat different from Karin's because even those, they're observable. I can eat, watch the person eating meat or the meat eaters. I wasn't thinking of that kind of coordination problem. I was thinking about things which literally cannot be monitored by anybody. What I do is entirely private. That's the uh, bit which I don't think will ever be resolved uh, except through self restraint. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's the first, and it has. Uh, the, I've tried to keep the text in English, even in the big the or, or text, if you like. Uh, but it has lots of boxes, lots and lots of boxes, annexes, star chapters for the mathematical parts of it, because everything is, as far as possible, proven as as in general form. Uh, but I, on the other hand, I wanted to reach the um, general public, the citizen, uh, concerned citizen, my ideal reader. And so I prepared a 100 page abridged version uh, of it. And that will also be uh, on, the, on the website and it will be published alongside with the main text. And then there is a, a very short four or five page, um, if you like, um, headline messages that my team produced because that's necessary for the decision makers in, in government uh, since the report is ultimately for uh, the, the UK Treasury and the government in general, and of course it'll be used by the Treasury and the government for, for the, uh, the COP15, which will be held next year in China. That's the uh, UN Biodiversity, the committee involved with biodiversity in parallel with Climate Change 26, which will be held in, in the UK uh, next year again. So we're making some progress in this area, but uh, this is the foundations for the biodiversity one. So it'll be February the 2nd, I think it'll be on, on, the, on the website, all three documents. Thank you, thank you very much. Simon, can I chime in a bit on that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, I, I perfectly agree with Partha that he, he was speaking about something else than the coordination problems that I spoke about. So that's, that's actually why I, I, I spoke about moral norms and social norms as different because what I think of as social norms is is requires some kind of observability by your peers. It's not as a, something what you do is not necessarily observable by the central authorities, but it might be observable by your peers. And in that case, you can have uh, social coordination or social norms, uh, if you're lucky, uh, help solve part of the problem. But I perfectly agree that a, a lot of these problems cannot be solved that way simply because even your peers will not see what you're doing. And then we need internalized moral norms. Right. Very good. I should say that the, the, the um, I mentioned at the beginning, the social norms issue is a huge one. Karina and I uh, were part of a, uh, a paper um, a few years back. Alessandro, I can't remember if you were part of that or not. Um, but we talked about it yesterday in, in, in terms of mask wearing. Uh, and, um, and it's going to come up again in terms of vaccine hesitancy. All, it, it's a cross cutting issue. Uh, Kanchan, I'd like to turn to you next um, for you to give us thoughts on any aspects of this or, or other issues that you'd like. Thank you. Uh, I'll do that. I'm fine with that. Uh, well, there are several challenges at the interface of ecology and the social sciences in particular economics. You wanted me to talk a little about natural capital accounting. I'll come to that. In the space of the last two decades, we've had a whole lot of general frameworks coming up. General frameworks or grand designs that provide space for linking the social sciences, in particular economics, with the with ecology. 
And of course, in the beginning, we thought that ecology and economics should be most easily thought of as having a common mathematical language and easy to, easy to uh, link to each other through that language. But they have to come out of their comfort zones. And context dependence makes it difficult. Oops. Oops. I think uh, we'll have to come back to Kanchan. She seems to have frozen now. Kanchan, uh, um, you, you've frozen temporarily. Some of these. Oh my, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll come back to now. Uh, yes, we can hear you now. Uh, but you keep freezing, maybe, maybe closing your, uh, uh, video and just coming in our, with, just by sound would work. Uh, we've now you're muted. We have your video. But... Yeah, I've unmuted myself. I'm sorry for that. I don't know what happened. <laughs> and uh, actually, uh, some developments, including attempts to capture climate tipping points in damage functions in econometrics and so on. And we have other uh, movements like the planetary boundaries approach. But more than that, when it comes to inclusive wealth and systems of national income, we want to link the systems of national income to uh, what is we call natural natural capital accounting. Now, how do we do that? That is the context dependence, which I'd like to talk about a little, uh, which is really in the sense of suppose I want to find out the part of the different kinds of capital. is what inclusive six or seven years ago, which was uh, basically, which was chaired by, which was chaired by uh, uh, Partha Das Gupta. And there we had referred to the uh, aspect there. But you have to get an estimate of the value of ecosystem services. Now, in order to value these ecosystem services, we need to know basics like, uh, for instance, production functions of life supporting systems. Now, uh, for economists, production functions are important. But when it comes to life supporting systems, it's very difficult because spatial and temporal boundaries of specific ecosystems need to be identified. Spatial and temporal boundaries of specific ecosystems need to be identified in order to integrate them, in order to get the value of that ecosystem service. As a grand design, it's fine. We will say we we'll value the ecosystem services. But in order to do that, and to integrate with systems of national income accounting, you need to know the boundaries of that ecosystem. And that is where it is a tough job. And that's one of I think we, we're frozen again. We'll come back to Kanchan. Um, actually integrate side looking at short. 
long-term impacts of development fine. Kanchan, can you hear me? I think we, uh, we're going to need to move on. Al Alessandro, um, I'd like you to, uh, to take over now and, and give us your views, and I'll see what we can do about Kanchan. OK, let me <clears throat> jump in, although it's going to be a tough role to follow such eloquent speakers. But I'd like to touch on, on some of the uh, topics that emerge uh, with Parta's uh, discussion and Karine's uh, points about social norms. Um, as I mentioned, I'm interested also in the behavioral aspects behind cooperation. And uh, uh, as we discussed before, oftentimes we simply do not observe, uh, either because nature does not uh, uh, scream and call our attention, or simply because our own actions are not observable themselves. And uh, in the situation when the social norm is low, meaning that that behavior is, is a niche, the pro-social behavior, the environmentally friendly behavior is still uh, so small in the population that uh, uh, we're, uh, we're talking about the niche behavior. How do we scale it up? How do we ramp it up? I think essentially what, uh, what we saw before is that there is a role for government to intervene and one channel could be, and I agree with the, uh, with what has been said by my partner and, uh, and Karim, that education instilling such uh, inclination, proclivity to cooperate and to uh, appreciate the environment is key. Uh, I think uh, in some of these situations, uh, uh, we can also have help from, uh, from interventions that may, uh, may not necessarily come from, from a government. And uh, uh, if you think of the economics profession, uh, a lot of the interest has, has traditionally been on self-interested motives. Uh, we, we discussed briefly before about uh, wealth maximization and, and these sort of drivers. However, uh, there are other motives. We know that from, from ample uh, evidence from social psychology, psychology, also behavioral economics. And some of these altruistic motives can be leveraged also when it comes to cooperation in, uh, in climate change dilemmas or global public goods. Um, so to be concrete, uh, we were discussing the situation when, uh, when, when a behavior is not observable. That is the most problematic, right? If I switch off my uh, lights at home or if I have a renewable energy contract that arguably is a little bit more costly, uh, no one knows about it unless I go about and, uh, and, and talk to my peers and friends and family and try to convince them. Uh, the, the economic interpretation of, uh, uh, of pro-social behaviors tend to focus on uh, what is known as uh, uh, image concerns or social signaling. That again is, um, is not an altruistic motive, but it is a self-interested one. I do something pro-social uh, because I, I hope that by doing, uh, by taking that action, uh, third uh, party observers, my peers, those that can actually see this behavior will, uh, will have a higher esteem or will return my behavior with, uh, with some kind of reciprocity. Now, what if the behavior is intrinsically hard to observe? Again, there's a role for for government or firms, uh, businesses to try and, uh, and modify this situation. So again, we are in a, in a coordination, in a bad equilibrium because people struggle to, uh, to witness, to observe potentially uh, inspiring pro-social behaviors by others. And uh, simple nudges uh, and interventions, again, at the firm level or mandated by the government can uh, reduce the cost of me uh, individually going around uh, shouting that I'm great because I have a renewable energy contract, which also can be seen as, as sort of socially costly, right? Uh, it could, uh, could be perceived as bragging. So uh, an intervention may, may aim to make it uh, 
public to make the decision uh, public to others so that imitation can, can kick in. And again, I have to, uh, to flag that in this domain, and, and here we, we go full circle and, and go back to, to education, I think that the economics profession can do more in terms of, uh, uh, of training uh, future uh, policymakers, future academics. Uh, I, I see it in my own university, I'm at the economics department, and uh, <clears throat> the students uh, uh, tend to uh, not be introduced uh, interdisciplinary concepts or even just uh, basic knowledge about climate change or even environmental economics until uh, later in their curriculum. And, uh, and again, the focus of the standard curriculum, if you, if you take sort of basic uh, uh, economic courses, tend to be on these self-interested rational. But uh, um, psychological evidence suggests that it is otherwise, and we, we have an innate proclivity for, uh, for cooperation. And so I think also by teaching that there may be more and, uh, and stressing these uh, sort of leadership and altruistic motives also in, uh, in the standard curriculum could, uh, could help out in, in bridging the gap that, that Partha so eloquently described in the introductory talk. Thank you very much. Andrea, I'm glad that uh, we can turn to get a, a perspective from outside economics, but uh, from someone who recognizes um, how important these issues are. So i uh, be interested in your thoughts on uh, what we've heard so far this morning. Um, thank you so much, uh, Simon. Yes, indeed, I'm very interested and very passionate about those subjects. As uh, you hinted, I, I see things from a narrow perspective, that of uh, the, uh, the, the perspective of water controls on living communities. And of course, not all ecosystems are water controlled. Many are light limited, many are nutrient limited. There are, um, uh, there are uh, several things. But, and yet, um, the, uh, the, uh, but many are. And in fact, uh, they, I'm advocating for the social and economic importance of many of those ecosystems. And for two different reasons, which I'll be discussing uh, in a second. I am obsessed, in fact, uh, and, and uh, even from our early work together, Simon and with Ignacio Rodriguez Iturbe, in fact, uh, from the, the, the in inherent uh, uh, weakness of many of our ecological predictions. And that's, in fact, uh, it's a permanent liability on our capability to put a price tag, in fact, on ecosystem services. And, uh, and, uh, and so well, I'm, I'm very touched when you say that um, uh, uh, about those characters that Partha was eloquently pointing out, that is these, um, these uh, the silent invisible characters uh, that uh, we may have uh, beneath our feet, uh, and something that cannot be monitored, but perhaps can be profitably guessed. And here I'm not quoting a scientist, but I'm quoting a poet, Odin. If I'm, I'm quoting by heart, I think I'm correct when he said that, um, knowledge may have its purposes, but guessing is always more fun than knowing. <laughs> and and uh, uh, why am I pitching for the water control ecosystem? Because there's something about the, 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 uh, uh, the substrate for ecological interactions. There's something about what we know about what uh, economists call externalities that can be useful uh, to predict uh, shifting patterns on rainfall, mean a hell of a lot for rain-fed agriculture, which is a major, a major driver of social well-being on a global scale, in fact. And we know a lot about the patterns of rainfall and how they affect uh, ecosystems and ecosystem services. And um, uh, uh, in the uh, accounting for the depreciation of natural capital, in fact, has some sort of inherent robustness when you're talking about water controls and uh, on, on those living communities. So uh, my, my uh, well, typical questions that uh, we'd like to, to, to point together it is, for instance, water management schemes and large-scale water management schemes mean a hell of a lot. Will future large-scale water resources management plans include biodiversity protections worldwide? Of course, to do that, we need to be sure that uh, our guessing um, is uh, complementing knowing uh, in a good and meaningful sense. Uh, could, for instance, the structure, something that we have studied together, Simon, for a long time, and with Ignacy too, like uh, the, the, the structure of the river network be a template on how deadly waterborne disease can spread. And, and something else which is also important, can we judge whether uh, uh, we can sort out having impact of improved agriculture, for instance, with its 
uh, well documented uh, inroads into the spreading of incidents of debilitating disease, for instance, um, uh, be accounted for properly? Can we, uh, and, and that's central in, in the reflection that it's a quantitative example of what Patha was saying when, uh, when uh, accounts that like uh, gross domestic products of ad hoc indicators of economic well being do not represent the depreciation for natural capital. So, in the GDP of Burkina Faso, where we did a hell of a lot of uh, field work, for instance, 15,000 small dams have been built and irrigation uh, structures have made a visible impact on the GDP of this uh, peculiar sub Saharan country. And yet, the uh, dramatically increased incidence of debilitating disease. Uh, is not accounted for in any of those, uh, of those indicators. So uh, my, my uh, in fact, uh, uh, biological invasions is another example. There is an inherent predictability about the biological invasion of alien species and uh, whose economics can be done based on the fact that we can actually uh, guess relatively well the possible scenarios in terms of what happens if uh, and uh, what happens if. And that happens to, uh, to uh, disease uh, uh, spread, actually. So uh, uh, we, uh, what I'm saying is that seen from outside and seen from a narrow perspective, the one I can't command, but I see that those issues would be central with respect to um, what we call eco-hydrological research, that is a research of a, a living communities controlled by water. Not again, uh, once or it has to be clear, an entire view to the ecosystem perspective, but certainly a narrow but significant one from a social and economic viewpoint. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Andrea, um, so I, we're just about out of time. Um, I want to thank all the, uh, uh, the panelists. Um, I, we've touched, just touched on, uh, on a lot of the um, great challenges that I think face us. Um, uh, uh, Partha talked about uh, biodiversity, the issue of discounting, uh, which we, we just barely scratched the surface on. We didn't talk much about equity, um, especially in intra-generational equity, uh, which is a crucial problem. Um, we heard about natural capital accounting from Kanchan uh, and about issues of cooperation and social norms, both from Karina and from um, Alessandro. Um, this is a, a rich interface. Um, in, in which not only are there um, a range of problems that are at the boundary between ecology and economics, but a recognition that that's, as Kenneth Arrow pointed out, it's not an accident that economics and ecology both start with eco, which means household, in the case of economics, household management. Um, the problems that we face are, are similar. Uh, public goods problems are prevalent throughout the natural world and in, in things as simple as the extracellular polymers that biofilms produce, the public goods problems that uh, tumors uh, undercut, um, and um, uh, bacterial um, <clears throat> biofilms that, that form all the way up to cooperation in bird flocks, fish schools, and up to humans. So they're not only interfaces, but great parallels, which is why, not surprisingly, many of the similar techniques, especially game theory, um, have um, permeated both, um, both disciplines. So take our word for it. This is an exciting area. There's much to be done, uh, both at the interface and by drawing parallels. Uh, we could go on for three hours easily on this, but I want to thank again the panelists very much. Uh, and, uh, um, and now uh, close the session. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao, Simon. Ciao, Patha. Ciao. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. My pleasure, too. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the technical. Not your. But, uh, but uh, anyway, that's fine. I'm sorry for the interruption. Not, not. I could, uh, not, not. anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank that's you. It.
Great. So thank you very much, uh, Simon, and to all the uh, panelists for this very interesting uh, session. So we are now taking a 15-minute break.